This episode of On the Track is dedicated with love and respect to Carl Schuker's mother, who died at five o'clock this afternoon. God bless you both. They came from the land of the icy sea to spend the week in Wolverine. They flew across the North Sea. Even Joe hates English tea. The Viking hordes forsook their fjord. The Danes are spending Easter at the CFZ. Looking for new land for pillage, Viking band came to our village like Joachim's even going to introduce this show! Hi, my name is Joachim Thomas, and welcome to another an episode of On The Track. Lars Thomas is one of the members of the CFZ family to whom I feel closest and it was a true joy to have him and his two sons, Joe and Chris, Joachim and Christoph, to come and spend Holy Week with us. We went out and about nearly every day and did various things of vague crypto or 14 importance. And on the last full day, Saturday, we had a house full of intelligent and cheerful teenagers. Just a cross-section of the young people that it has been my privilege and pleasure to help along the way over the years. And it was a very real joy to hear the house reverberate with teenage laughter and silliness for the first time since I was about that age, nearly 40 years ago. All the young people who were there yesterday, Joe and Chris, Harriet Wadham, Jessica Taylor and her boyfriend Matthew, will be at the weird weekend and I look forward to seeing them there and doing various projects with them all together and separately over the years to come. But all too soon it was over and on the Sunday morning at a depressingly early hour Lars, Joe and Chris left us and walked up the hill to their car to travel back to Gatwick. We shall truly miss them. We did a lot of interesting stuff over the week but one of the results of that is that this episode of On the Track is very much Dano-centric, if that's the right word. Which is why I had Joachim introduce me this time. After having been the butt of my jokes all week, the poor boy probably deserves it. But I think first we should go over to Lars Thomas to hear about something extraordinary which happened on their first morning in Wolseley. The first morning uh, on our Easter holiday here in Wilshire, I went for a little walk around the village. And I was uh, standing on <clears throat> the road just off the uh, commun community hall where the re weekend is held. And when this little red car stopped beside me and a man rolled down the window, leaned out and said rather aggressively, Are you one of those blokes from the weird weekend? And I said, Well, yes, I am. And he told me that. Uh, a couple of days before that, which would be Sunday the 24th of March, he'd been driving through Wolseri around about midnight when a big black animal that looked like a very large house cat with a very long tail and light underside had run across the road. It was coming from where the com community hall is. It ran across and then uh, continued past some bushes and a tree and then disappeared from sight. And the man didn't stop to investigate, but he just kept on driving through the village. So I went over to the bushes and uh, to the tree and examined it, because this animal might have, have left some hairs. And in a little, on a little branch, about a foot off from the ground, I found some hairs. 
this little branch here has uh, a tuft of hairs in the end, and they might be leopard hairs, they might be cat hairs, they might be dog hairs, I don't know. They're going back to Denmark with me, and I'm going to analyze them and uh, get the news off to the CFZ as quick as possible. So stay tuned, there might be exciting news coming your way. Regular CFZ watchers will know that for some years now we have been studying reports of big cats seen in Huddersfield Woods, an area of woodland just outside the village of Woolsbury where we live. So far our investigations reached their peak back in the summer of 2010 when a team led by Lars Thomas found hairs from which later DNA was extracted proving that they were from a leopard of the sub-Saharan subspecies. The sightings continued, and we've been waiting for Lars to come back and see if any more hairs could be found. One of the things that we have been doing during our Easter holiday here in Wulsuri was to go for a little walk in Hodisford Wood, where we found leopard hairs in 2010. Uh, I'm not sure what we actually found this time, but we found several branches with hairs, and I'm going to take them back to Denmark and analyze them to see if uh, there's still a leopard lurking in Hottisford Wood. Changing the subject away from mystery cats for a while, although we will be back on the subject later on in the episode. The other day, Lars and the boys went with me and Karina to Fremington Quay, which is one of those places I discovered fairly recently, which is an amazing place to watch birds. And we saw quite a few interesting species, but there were two in particular which really, really made an impact on us. The first, this is a spotted red shank. According to the RSPB website, only about a hundred of these birds overwinter in Britain each year. So here we were, looking at 1% of the total population in the UK. Later on we saw another one. And it was a pretty awesome experience but nothing compared to this. This is a European spoonbill, and again, according to the RSPB website, only about 20 overwinter in Britain each year, so this is 5% of the total British population. Or rather, about 5% of the total British overwintering population, because there are a small colony in Norfolk. This is an absolutely fantastic bird to see. And in the year and a half that Karina and I have been bird watching, I think this has got to be the most special thing that we have seen yet. Many years ago, in the summer of 1969, when my family still lived in Hong Kong, we came back to England for six weeks holiday, and we stayed at a place called Dunstan House, which was just outside the village of Widdicombe in the Moor in the middle of Dartmoor and it has remained one of my favourite places in the world ever since, and it was a great joy to be able to take Lars and the boys along the lanes that I explored with my grandmother all those years ago. The lanes where we picked wild gooseberries, and where we found streams in which we collected tiddlers and little insects. That summer was one of the most magical times in a not very happy childhood and I look back upon it with great love. And it was quite a special experience to be able to share one of my favourite places with my friends from Denmark. And even in the middle of the coldest spring for many years and seen out of the window of a hire car, the little winding lane from Dunstan to Widdicombe has lost none of its magic. One day soon I'm going to take some of my young friends who are much more limber than I am after many years of diabetes and debilitating illness and I'm going to go back to the streams by Dunstan House and I want to check if they're still as full of wildlife as they were all those years ago. Now there's a little ditch here, a little teensy stream down the side, yeah. and back in the late 1960s, there were actually fish in there. You could walk along here and you'd see little bullheads brushing past. 
on both sides. You know, it's a teensy screen, then you it's lift to left. Okay. It's a teensy screen here, but there used to be bull heads in there. Yeah. I often wonder if there's still are. Because I've never seen fish in such a small stream before. Also, while we were on Dartmoor, we went to Hand Tor, which is one of my favourite places. And it's also, as well as being the haunt of a ghostly black dog, which may or may not have inspired the most famous Sherlock Holmes novel, it is also the haunt of a takeaway food caravan, which has got the best and certainly the most Fortean name that I have ever read. When one is doing a tour of Fortean Dartmoor, there are some places that you really cannot miss, such as Jay's Grave. And for those of you who do not know the story, here it is. According to the story, this is the grave of a girl called Kitty Jay, who worked as an apprentice at a local farm, found herself pregnant by the farmer's son, and was thrown out into the cold outside world. Rather than face social ruin and an uncertain future as an unwed mother, which was a completely debilitating stigma back at the end of the 18th century, she killed herself, and was buried at this crossroads, according to local custom. The body of a suicide could not be buried in consecrated ground, and with a stake through her heart she had to be buried at a crossroads so her ghost would not know which way to walk. A ghostly figure has been seen by the grave over the years, whether it's her ghost, the ghost of the boy who made her pregnant, or the ghosts of the people who forced her into her dreadful decision, we don't know, and we probably never shall. But the most interesting thing about the Kitty J story is that to this day there are still flowers every day on her grave. Whether the flowers are put there by passers-by, by people from the village, or by the Morland Pixies, as my father told me when I was a little boy, I don't know. I like to think it's the Pixies. Although I have been known to put flowers there myself. And even though we were on the moor, the bird-watching continued. We saw this wheat ear and several others in the car park just below Hay Tor, and on the way back we visited two other places of fortune's zoological interest. This is a holy well in the little town of Bobby Tracy, where in the Middle Ages it is alleged that the Virgin Mary appeared to a poor woodcutter, blessed the well, and golden frogs were found swimming in there from this time on. Golden frogs have definitely been reported in the area, so you never know. And this is Lustly Cleave, one of the most spectacularly weird places in Devonshire. Over the years there have been reports of UFOs here, animal mutilations here, and a family of ghostly cavemen were reported next to a stone circle. It's also where two teenage boys found a puma skull, which turned out to have been wrapped in a plastic bag. But that fact was conveniently forgotten by quite a few of the chroniclers on the subject. But now, enough of Dartmoor, let's talk about the Medcroc. One, two, three, four. Ich bin Schnappi, das kleine Krokodil. Ich komm aus Egypt. This is a song which Joe and Chris sang on the back of the car as we drove across Dartmoor, and I became very fond of it. Apparently, it is the theme song from a German kids' cartoon about a little crocodile which lives in Egypt, and so it seemed appropriate for this next story. It is quite widely believed that some of the accounts of dragons and other scaly monsters in southern European and North African countries are the result of race memories of when there were crocodiles living in and around the Mediterranean. Furthermore, some people believe that they exist to this very day. The flames of this particular theory have been fanned recently by a series of sightings of what appears to be an alligator near a golf course east of Marbella in southern Spain. 
The beast, dubbed locally as the Costa Croc, was first seen last month. This week, officers from Ciprona, a special nature protection unit from the Civil Guard, confirmed the presence of the last reptile after finding its footprints in undergrowth beside the Madeira Bea, an area of man-made lakes just inland from the coast. Authorities have posted red danger signs across the zone, a popular walking spot bordering a private golf course bordering grave danger crocodile on the loose. Special police motorcycle units are patrolling the area in the hope of locating the animal, which estimates to bear measure between six and seven feet from nose to tail. It is, of course, almost certainly an American alligator which was kept illegally and subsequently released. Pity that. I'd love there to be bona fide med crocs. I've always maintained that the most important role of the CFZ is to find out the truth behind various mysteries. We're not here to prove, we're not here to disprove, just to find out the truth, because in the end, the truth is the most important thing. So please don't be too disappointed by this latest report from Lars. But I think before we start, we ought to take a little trip down memory lane to the spring of last year. In 2008, Richard Freeman took a CFZ team to southern Russia, to Kalbadino, Bulgaria, in search of the Almasty. For those of you not in the know, the Almasty is a semi-mythical, upright-walking, bipedal creature, probably more man than ape, which has been reported all the way across what used to be Soviet Central Asia. For those of you not in the know here, Kabardino Balkaria is an autonomous republic in southern Russia. It has a long and checkered history and is the homeland, as the name implies, for two different peoples, the Kabardins and the Balkars. This chap is Ukrainian cryptozoologist Gregory Panchenko. We first met him a few years ago when we invited him to come over to the Weird Weekend, our annual convention as a speaker. About the caucuses, uh, where our work basically happened. Uh, our group works uh, in uh, constant contacts. Apart from Richard Freeman, Keith Townley, Adam Davis, Dave Archer, and Chris Clark, Gregory brought along two of his colleagues. This is Anatoly Sarandenko, a Ukrainian archaeologist who works for the Russian government surveying the tombs of the Sarmatians. These, in case you didn't know, were an Iron Age people who originated in ancient Persia and flourished between the 5th century BC and the 4th century AD. After the expedition returned to the UK, we kept in touch with Gregory and his colleagues. They've been studying the Almasty all across that part of Eastern Europe for many years. About a year ago, in March 2011, Anatoly had been exploring a place in the eastern Ukraine when he found what he believes may be the droppings of an Almasty. He parceled them up, gave them to Gregory, who sent them to us. Now, this week at the CFZ, we have a special visitor. It's a young lady called Saskia, who's doing a week's work experience with us. We're very pleased to have her, but we gave the poor girl a baptism of fire because her first job was to help Richard unpack and divide specimens of what may well be the droppings of an ancestral human. I'm sure her school friends working in offices around Biddeford for a week will never have anything like this to report. We've been sent what may be some Almasty dung. This was taken late last year in the eastern part of the Ukraine by Anatoly, uh, an archaeologist who is a friend of Gregory Panchenko. He's the Ukrainian biologist that accompanied us on our 2008 expedition in search of the Almasty in the Caucasus Mountains of Russia. Uh, it could just turn out to be bare or something mundane but it's always better to get these things checked out. So we're breaking the sample up uh, into several pieces which we're sending away to various experts to have it analysed.
Ah, now, there's a surprise for us. Gregory didn't tell us that it was liquid. <laughs> this is liquid suspended. It's suspended in, in some sort of liquid, um, maybe water. So unfortunately we're not going to be able to break that apart <laughs> unless we uh, make ice cubes out of it. So I think that's going to have to go to our old mate Lars Thomas. Unfortunately, um, I was expecting <laughs> solid lumps instead. We've got liquid. What a surprise, liquid faeces. A delightful surprise. So after all of this, all of setting up the semi-sterile environment, you and Saskia having rubber gloves and everything, it was all a complete waste of time. Not a complete waste of time because it, it shows Saskia how things are done when you have um, proper samples. Welcome to the world of cryptozoology, Saskia. It smells like it's preserved in alcohol, believe it or not. I never thought I'd say this sentence, but this possible Almasty faeces smells rather like a liqueur chocolate. That is peculiar. Uh, we'll put it into a Ziploc bag. Stick a label on it. And then we'll send that off to our old mate Lars. If it had been solid, we would have broken it up, send, sent some to Professor Brian Sykes, some to Todd Dissertel, and, and various other uh, people to have it analysed. But as it is, it's liquid, so um, we've got to send it all to one person, and Lars is the top of the list at the minute. So, Saskia, this is something I don't think anybody else in your work experience group at school will have had this happen this week, will they? Mm. <laughs> okay, what we have to do now is to parcel it up to go to Denmark and you two are both going, you two, or rather Richard, because it would be totally and utterly unethical for me to get a young lady who's only with us for a week to lie to the Manchester Post Office. You're going to have to work out what you say on the customs declaration forms and leave to Denmark, but you can't say it's possible human species preserved in alcohol. Or we'll say biological sample. We're off to uh, the post office and uh, how does it feel to be posting eight man poo to Denmark? Unusual. <laughs> I don't suppose you'd ever thought you'd be posting eight man poo anywhere, let alone Denmark. Definitely not. Are you together? That's nice. <laughs> so airmail to Denmark, please. Talking to me? Yeah. But I'm on camera, am I? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Could have told me I would have put some lipstick on. <laughs> by five Great shots. Um, five shots? Yeah. Five five. Not fair, not fair. I think I'll smile more, otherwise I'd look grumpy, wouldn't I? Sure you won't, but you never know. But then. See you later. Yeah. 193. Okay. That's not bad actually, is it? No, not to Denmark. Really? What's this need with them? Um... It's the dung of an Almasty suspended in alcohol. Sent off for DNA analysis. No, no, I mean the camera, not in your parcel. Oh, right, sorry. Oh, oh it's for our monthly documentary. We, oh. we make an <laughs> hour long documentary every month. And both. <coughs> it's worth waiting, wasn't it, Richard? <laughs> right, next. You went post office alone? Don't worry, you get the camera. I'm sorry, I'm not leaving you late to ask what's in people's parcels and you just tell me. It's the, it's the excrement of a, what we think is a primitive relative of the ancestors of man. Really? Taken in the eastern Ukraine, yeah. So it's just a plain of poo, really? Yes. 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 It's poo in alcohol and it smells like a chocolate liqueur because of the alcohol it? it's suspended in. Does it taste like it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 258? Sorry, I, I said one something that was 258. Is that alright? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, please. 
I'm incredibly grateful to the people of Walsall for putting up with us. I mean, we do do some pretty extraordinary things, and we do have a habit of taking over the pub, the post office, the community centre, and various other places to film or to carry out experiments. Thanks very much, guys. We do appreciate it. Last year, Grigory Panchenko found some samples of the Asian wild man Yelma or Almasti in the Crimea. Uh, and I've been trying to get some DNA samples from these and try to analyze them. But unfortunately, the DNA is in such a sorry state that we can't say anything for certain. So uh, until some other samples comes our way, we still don't know what's going on with the wild men of Asia. But there's more. Nurse! <laughs> One of the foolproof ways to identify a fish species is by examining its otoliths. Otoliths are bones in the middle of the inner ear. Now it so happens that our old friend Lars Thomas from the University of Copenhagen is an expert on fish otoliths. And it also so happens that we have some fish in our collection that are from an undescribed species. We know that they come from Peru and we know that they're cichlids of the genus Equidens, but we don't know any more. Lars suggested that when one or more of them die, that we remove the otoliths and send them to him, so that he can examine them. But the big problem here was that nobody knew how to remove the otoliths. So, a couple of days after the weird weekend, Lars conducted a master class. Now, there's, there's three different ways of, of removing otoliths from a fish. And it all depends on the size of the fish and uh, what, uh, what species is this, how, how thick skulled it is and whether you, how pristine you want the fish to, uh, to be afterwards. Uh, you can either, um, this is best for, for big fish, you can go in through the back here. If you cut away the, gill, the gills, you get into the bottom of the skull mm -hmm. and if you take a slice off the bottom of the skull, you can, you can pick out the, uh, the otolith that way. But it's easier to do on a big fish. Yep. And you can, depending on the size of the shape, uh, the size and shape of the head, you can simply cut off the top of the skull, so you get to the brain, and uh, you remove the brain, and the, the otoliths are located in, in two pockets in the bottom of the skull, <coughs> just below the brain. And they're, they're just, you know, lying loosely, like a pe uh, couple of pe pebbles in these pockets in, in the bottom of the skull. Uh, they're not covered in any way or connected to anything. They're just flat, rattling about in, in uh, those pockets. In smaller fishes like this one, uh, it is in fact easier to to cut them, cut the skull through here in the middle and you know, kind of open the heads up to both sides and you have half a brain on each side and you can usually just see the otolids and pick them out. But uh, sometimes it's, it's very difficult because some species of fish have extremely small otolids compared to their sizes and some of them have extremely big otolids. You can have small fish with very large otolids and you can have very big fish with very, very small otolids. So you, you never uh, quite know for certain whether it's going to be one or the other if it's in a species you haven't uh, examined before. Because even closely related species can, although their otoliths will look similar in shape, they can be quite different in, in size. So we'll see what we will we can find in this one. And sometimes you have trouble with various fish, spe fish species, with especially if their their head has a strange shape. Flatfish is mm. it can be absolutely murder to find. Well, they have fairly big otoliths, but because their skull is completely twisted to the side, it can be difficult to actually ascertain where to find them. Mm. So that can end in a lot of disgusting things. 
bits of bits of brain flying about and so on. Uh, okay, now we cut up here, yeah, and what you see there is half of the brain of the fish. Mm -hmm. And over here we have it's a bit more broken over here, but over here we have the other half of the brain. And somewhere in here, now this is a bit mushy. You will find the autolith. You can they're easy. Oh, luckily these. These guys have very large autolits, so they're easy to find. And here we are. Mm. Here's one. Mm -hmm. And you can see they have this, they have a very, they're usually quite easy to find because they have a very different color from, uh, from the rest of the, the bones. Mm -hmm. And that, that's because they have a different chemical composition than, than normal fish bone. They're, they are very much more durable than the rest of the bones, which is why you can use them for identifying what fish eating species are eating, because most of the rest of the fish will be digested, but these will survive almost uh, unharmed. Mm. Uh, so uh, you can find them in the stomach contents of, of seals or in the scats of seals. Uh, if you wash them out, you can pick out these uh, quite easily. And since everyone has, every fish has two, and they're mirror images of one another, you can say how many they've eaten. Mm -hmm. And you can also, just from the size of this, say something about the size of the actual fish. So you know how many fish it's eaten, how big they were, and, and you can also, you can age uh, fish uh, from the autolites. They, ha they have growth, growth rings, just like tree trunks. Mm -hmm. And you can see how many years this, whether it be two-year-old fish or five-year-old fish or whatever. Uh, for the last several months, I've been doing an autolytic examination of some fishes from the CFZ stock of various watery creatures. They are cichlids from South America, and uh, no one knows for certain what species they are. But uh, if you examine the autolytes of these fishes, you can actually determine uh, what they are with very high degree of certainty. Now, I haven't finished my uh, various uh, measurements and so on, but I'm 99% sure that uh, this fish is actually an already well-known species, but I'll let you know as soon as I'm finished and as soon as I'm certain. But there's more. Here are two white hairs that were sent to us from Sharon Larkin and they are from a possible lynx sighting at Todd Hills, not far away from Rockcliffe in Carlisle. Okay, I'll bring those home with me to Denmark and take a closer look. Luckily it's fairly easy to identify lynx hairs or indeed uh, to discern between dog hairs and big cat hairs, so this would be quite easy and you should get news about this fairly quickly. And what else have you got there, Karina? There's another little Easter present for Lars. Ah, yes. <laughs> the continuing story about the CFZ spiny mice. Uh, several years ago, or Lewis gave me, just for fun, a hair sample from one of the CFZ spiny mice. And I took it back home and I had a look at it and I wasn't able to identify it or to uh, with any of the known species of spiny mice. And so, for all these years, I've been saying the next time one of the mouse dies, please save it for me so we can uh, make a closer examination and perhaps say that this is in fact a new species of spiny mice. It might be a hybrid of already known species, I don't know, but uh, at least now we are going to get a definitive answer because for all these years I've been checking hair samples of spiny mice from all the museums I could lay my hands on spiny mice. and. Uh, I still don't know what it is, but uh, this hopefully will provide us with the answer. I think you'll probably be impressed, Lars. You've always told us not to put uh, specimens we, you want to look for DNA into formaldehyde. Yeah. So 
Emma Osborne, who has now got custody of the CFZ spiny mice, brought you to that. It's in vodka. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. In that case, we should get some decent DNA samples out of it. Well, I bought chocolate eggs for your two sons for Easter. You got a load of hair samples and a dead mouse. <laughs> Happy Easter. And now I think it's time to go over to my lovely wife, Karina, and our monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment of On the Track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals, and in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Right, for March 2013. Over the past decade, there have been just a handful of records of the Kentish plover. But on the 24th of March, there was one recorded at Ferry Bridge in Dorset, followed on the 25th by two more at Rye Harbour in East Sussex. A former breeder in the UK, this bird is a scarce visitor and breeds in Europe and Asia, wintering in southern Europe, to Central Africa, and southeastern Asia. It lives on beaches, mudflats, rivers and lakes, and feeds on insects inland, and across stations, worms and mollusks on coasts. It was first recorded in 1787 in Kent. Between the 23rd of January to the 3rd of March, a white-throated sparrow was in a garden in Church Stanton in Somerset. I've made a typo there. This is a rare visitor to our shores and breeds in northern North America and winters south to Mexico. In the summer it feeds on insects and some fruit and in the winter it eats mostly small seeds and fruit. It lives in open woodland and bogs. It occurs in two colour forms, white and tan crowned and the males of both forms prefer females with white stripes. However, the females of both prefer tan-striped males. This means that the birds usually mate with the opposite moth. It was first recorded in 1909 in the Western Islands. Don't push. There were seven green-winged teal reported during March. Two were at, Sa at Saul Wharf in Gloucestershire on the 8th, which was probably a bird seen at Slimbridge as well, and at Loch Athwil, Tyree on the 11th. Apologies for the bad pronunciation there. The other five were in Cornwall, Hampshire, Warwickshire, Cleveland, and Dumfries and Galloway. There were Irish birds in County Cork, County Wexford, and County Down, as well as one at Ashton's Callows in Tipperary. This is a scarce visitor that breeds in North America and winters south to North Central America. It feeds on seeds, vegetation and invertebrates and lives on lakes, marshes, ponds and shallow streams. It was first recorded in the UK in 1840 in Hampshire. On the 18th, a male snowy owl was seen north of the summit of Ben McDewey. In, in mid February 2008, a male was seen in the same general area, and with a number of regularly returning snowy owls recorded in recent years, such as the Outer Hebrides and County Mayo, it seems fair to suggest that this is the same male. Whether he spends just the winter here or is resident remains to be seen. A rare visitor, this bird can be found in northern Europe, northern Asia, and north. North America, where it lives on tundra, moving in the winter to fields and prairie. It feeds on lemmings and voles, and sometimes includes small birds in its diet. There was a pair breeding for eight years on the Shetland Island of Fetler up until 
until 1976, but the male failed to return in that year, although two females continued to sum annually until 1993. The first record was in 1808, again in Shetland. The 23rd of March brought the sighting of a red rumped swallow on St Mary's on Scilly. A scarce visitor, this bird's range is southern Europe, Asia and northern and central Africa. It lives in open country and towns and feeds on flying insects. The first record was in 1906 on Fair Isle. That's just about it this month. And so now it's over to Jonathan, I've forgotten his name, nearly called him Richard. Over to Jonathan for this month's look at new and rediscovered species. Bye bye. A team from the Worldwide Fund of Nature on the island of Borneo who were monitoring orangutan populations have discovered what they believe to be the footprints of the Sumatran rhinoceros in an area where it believes that the rhino had been extinct for some time. The Worldwide Fund for Nature staff were monitoring a population of orangutans in West Kutai district of East Kalimantan. Having discovered the footprints, they conducted a further survey of the area along with government forestry officials and scientists from a local university. The survey discovered further footprints and some horn scratches at mud holes, as well as trees used as rubbing posts and bite marks on plants, raising the possibility that there may be more than one lone animal, although numbers remain unclear. The Sumatran rhino is believed to have been extinct in Indonesian Borneo since the 1990s, and fewer than 200 animals exist anywhere in the world in the wild. Gekkoella jaiporensis, or the Jaipur Grand Gecko, an enigmatic lizard from the Eastern Ghats which was ex considered to be extinct, has been rediscovered after a gap of 135 years, according to naturalists at the Bombay Natural History Society. This species was recently rediscovered in Andhra Pradesh and Orissa, the results of which have been published in the journal Hamadryad, the product of two years of collaborative work between scientists from the Centre for Ecological Services, the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, the Bombay Natural History Society and Villanova University in the United States. This gecko, a lizard of the family Gekonidae, is morphologically unique and was only known from a single male specimen collected in 1877 by British Colonel R.H. Bedomi from the Jaipur Hills in Orissa. Though subsequent efforts were made by researchers, scientists and nature enthusiasts, the species was not seen in the intervening 130 plus years. And that's not the only rediscovered herb from the Indian subcontinent. In 1853, Edward Frederick Kelliart, a physician and naturalist, collected a strange frog on the island of Sri Lanka, which was then a British colony known as Ceylon. The specimen was a large shrub frog about two inches long, with black outlined white specks on lime green skin. He dubbed it Starry after its paley specks, but that was the last anyone heard of it. Even the holotype, the body of the amphibian collected by Kelliart, went missing. Fast forward nearly 160 years, two world wars, Sri Lanka's independence and a man on the moon, when a recent investigation into Sri Lanka's peak wilderness rediscovered a beguiling frog with pinkish specks. These quite stunning frogs were observed peached on leaves in the canopy. They were slow moving, we select collected samples which we thought were new species. But after reviewing past work, especially extinct species, it was evident that this was Pseudopleatus stellatus, L.J. Mendes Wickerensing told Monga Bay. Kellat's starry shrub frog had been rediscovered. Wickerham Singh, the lead author of the paper announcing the discovery in zoo taxa, says one reason why the starry shrub frog remained undetected for so long was its habitat. We worked in parts of the peak wilderness sanctuary where previous studies had never taken place, he said in tough and rugged conditions, so hardly any researchers had actually gone to these sites. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. That's about it for this time. I'd like to say a very big thank you to Lars Thomas and his sons, to my lovely wife, Karina, to Graham, to Richard, and to Dave Paul Phillips, everybody without whom I could not have done this episode. We'll be back in a month's time. We've got all sorts of exciting things in the pipeline as well as upcoming news at the forthcoming weekend. So watch the space. 
Until next time, see La 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 la